this is John Rubino from dollarclass.com, and you're listening to Run to Gold. Welcome back to episode 77 of the Run to Gold.com podcast. This is an interview I did with the Daily Commodities, and we discuss a multitude of topics. So let's just dive right in. Trace, as we get started, I want to talk about your book, The Great Credit Contraction. I feel like the inflation-deflation argument that we see so often today really misses what's going on, and that is a major credit contraction in the Western world. And precious metals seem to perform well in this environment, whether the outcome is deflation or hyperinflation. Do you agree with me, and can you explain this credit contraction and some of the outcomes we should be looking for? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, we, we can get started right there with that. On RunToGold.com and the, on the lower right part of the website, I've got this uh, liquidity pyramid. It's uh, called the Great Credit Contraction. And throughout history, what's happened uh, pretty much since the industrial age started, you know, 500 years ago, is that capital has moved up this liquidity pyramid into less safe, uh, more risky investments. So it's moved from using a silver coin to buy bread uh, in ordinary daily transactions to uh, credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations and mortgage-backed securities and GE stock and uh, pension plans and government pension plans and uh, other government liabilities like Social Security and Medicare, all these promises that uh, they won't be able to keep, incidentally. But throughout the, this 500 years, we've had this great credit contraction going on, which has uh, led to people taking on more and more risk with less and less liquidity. Well, monetary science, economic law, uh, it it predicts that there will come a time when there will be a change in psychology, a change in the way people think and what will ha- and feel. And what will happen is capital will begin to retreat down the pyramid and it will move into safer, more liquid assets. For example, people will say, you know what, I don't want to own a mortgage-backed security. I would rather have treasury bills because they're safer and more liquid. Or I would rather have gold instead of treasury bills, because gold can always buy something, it always has for 5,000 years, and it can never become worthless because it's an actual tangible asset. And so that's what's happening is we've just begun this great credit contraction. I think a lot of people underestimate the size and scope of what's going on, but we're seeing the reversal of a 500-year trend. And within that 500 years, we had little credit contractions. Uh, like when the uh, the Bank of England in 1694, you know, they had a credit contraction and it really destabilized everything politically. And Isaac Newton developed the gold standard uh, as master of the mint. And then we had a credit contraction uh, in the 1930s. But in all of these uh, credit contractions, the general trend worldwide was still to move up this liquidity pyramid. But now... Uh, in in this decade, we've actually begun to see the reversal of this 500-year trend. And we're going to go back to using gold and silver as currency in, in ordinary daily transactions. And not just gold and silver, but probably platinum and palladium and other uh, elements which have similar monetary properties as gold and silver because they're not special for any reason uh, chemically. I mean, uh, they're... You know, they, they, there are other metals that can, can serve a similar purpose, and, and they will serve a similar purpose in the information age that we're moving into. So that's what's happening. Capital is moving down the pyramid into safer, more liquid assets. And as a result, this liquidity pyramid, there's a lot of fictitious capital, capital that's never really existed, that the, that the economy has never had the capacity to perform on these promises. And so that fictitious capital, it just evaporates into nothing it becomes absolutely worthless. And that's what we're seeing with a lot of these mortgage-backed securities or all the other assets that are getting thrown into the Fed's garbage can. Uh, What they're doing is they're allowing the big banks and stuff to move down the liquidity pyramid and not lose their purchasing power. And they're sticking uh, the taxpayer and a lot of pension funds and people like that with the bill. So in effect, they've been able to privatize the gains over this great credit expansion. And now when the losses are, the inevitable losses are coming, they're able to socialize those losses. And that's that's what we're seeing and why we're seeing this decline in standard of living also. 
Well, Trace, that's a real excellent explanation. And I want to talk about the emerging markets, but before we get into that, I have a couple follow-up questions on the outcomes. I mean, you talked about gold and silver. That's obviously at the bottom of the pyramid. And right above that, we have things like T-bills, if I'm correct. Now, yes. so, you know, now we see basically in the last couple of years, you know, since 2008, we've seen tons of money move into fixed income. And we've also seen, I don't want to say a lot of money, but we have seen money move into precious metals and other commodities. Um, I mean, at some point, does this, a lot of this money in uh, T-bills and fixed income, at some point, is that going to move into precious metals? And my second question would be, where do the other commodities, the non-monetary commodities, how do they fit in to this pyramid exactly? Yeah, well, there's uh, kind of to go after that second question first. Uh, you've got you've got within the commodities, you've got your soft and your hards. Now, the soft commodities, really, all commodities are competitors to the these synthetic fiat currencies. So, corn and wheat, you could actually say that that's a competing currency. Now, the reason it doesn't really function as a currency is because the interest rate on it or in other words, the cost to store and protect and insure it is really high. So it doesn't serve very efficiently as money. Now gold, silver, those serve very efficiently as money. It's easy to store them, easy to protect them, easy to insure them. And so we have other commodities that also uh, uh, perform those similar types of monetary functions like platinum and palladium. Uh, but they aren't being used really as money yet. But uh, as I see this great credit contraction uh, playing out over the next 5, 10, 25 years, uh, we're going to see, you know, platinum and palladium will function as alternative currencies just like, you know, gold will be like the, tre the U.S. dollar, silver will be like the euro, platinum will be like the yen, for example, palladium will be like the British pound as far as like depth of capital that's uh, stored in them. Uh, but that, you know, that's how we'll see the different commodities play out. Now, with the soft commodities, with the commodities that, you're, that are produced primarily to be consumed, uh, because we have to distinguish between commodities that are produced primarily to be hoarded, well, those are monetary commodities. I mean, why do we produce gold? What value does it add to society? Well, the only value it adds is in performing these mental calculations of value, in being able to perform its role as money. And, you know, the reason we produce corn or wheat or oil, you know, we eat corn, we eat wheat, we produce oil to burn and, and run our cars and things like that. So the commodities that we produce to, to use and consume, uh, in a lot of cases, those prices will be going down when priced in gold. However, priced in fiat currency, those prices uh, are going to be going up because the fiat currencies are all evaporating. Uh, they're all becoming worthless. They're all returning to their intrinsic value, which is nothing. And we see this uh, with the 10-year gold uh, bull market, which really is just a bear market in fiat currencies. Right. And uh, that, I mean, I just want to elaborate on that point you make. It's interesting because if you look at commodities priced against other currencies, I mean, we know the dollar has been a little bit stronger over the last couple of years, although it's really tanked in the last month or so. But prior to that, I mean, if you just look at commodities priced against the euro, priced against pounds, priced against the basket of currencies, I mean, they're basically almost back to their 2008 highs, or I think in some cases they're even above their 2008 highs. And so well, let, me, let me go back to my first question about um, money moving into T-bills and, and government bonds. I mean, is there some point when, like at the very end of this, do we see money come out of that and then in mass it really starts to go into the precious metals, the monetary metals? Or are we just going to kind of see at the same time we're going to see a lot of money moving into both of those things? I mean, how, how does that play out exactly? Well, <coughs> how it plays out is... Uh, you know, markets search for equilibrium, and fiat currencies are intrinsically worthless. So their equilibrium price is zero. The only reason these fiat currencies have value is because uh, the governments that are behind them have the ability to tax or to redistribute the capital. Now, during the industrial age, the economics behind the use of violence, and remember, taxes are just enforced or they're, they're uh, extortions. 
you know, it, who who wants to willingly pay taxes? Uh, because if they wanted to willingly pay them, then it would be a charitable contribution, for example, instead of a tax. So taxes are fundamentally premised on the use of violence. Now, during the industrial age, the economics behind the use of violence uh, promoted the use of these fiat currencies because you you really had to have large scale ability to protect the wealth generating assets and the wealth generating assets the holders of capital who own those they were very susceptible to having violence used against them to extort them of money for example a mine or a factory how easy is it to to move a factory around you know the barrier to exit is really high or in the case of a mine i mean you can't move the mine uh, and so labor, you know, organized labor or government through taxes, they were able to tax the holders of capital. And this gave rise to, you know, these very large institutions and organizations, whether it's the governments or the big companies like uh, GE or General Motors or whatnot. Well, in the information age, the, the very, you know, this, this ability to use violence prop profitably uh, is pretty much gone. Uh, we can't, like... The, the, the economics of the information age are such that you can't use violence and generate a positive return on investment uh, as easily. Because one, the cost of protection is so low, and two, the cost to extort the holders of capital is very high. So, it, you know, if you're able to protect your wealth generating assets and you spend no money and maybe 10 seconds of time, but in order to extort, uh, that holder of capital, you have to spend thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours, well, the return on investment isn't going to be very high. But that's exactly what we see with things like encryption and with the wealth generating assets. I mean, look at the big growth uh, that's happening. You've, you've got companies like Google or Walmart or FedEx, uh, and these are information age type companies. You know, it, it's about routing and controlling the flow of information. And those are the wealth generating assets. It's not necessarily the mine or the factory anymore. And so with the click of a mouse, you can move jurisdictions. The barrier to exit is so low. And so that's, what's, that's what gold is signaling, is it's signaling that the business model of these institutions, and really you should look at fiat currencies as the common stock of nations. So it's saying that the business model of these nations and these governments is flawed. And that's why the, the fiat currencies are, are becoming worth less and less in terms of gold. Because as a business model, uh, they, they are going to face huge competition and huge uh, changes in the information age. Just like, you know, just like newspapers have had to really adapt or die in the information age. It's no different for governments. You know, their business is just like everything else. And they're going to have to find a way to provide their, their services uh, in, a, in a way that they're able to get the capital from their customers, uh, who are usually, you know, in the industrial age, they weren't customers, they were slaves. But in the information age, uh, people have a lot more choice, and especially holders of capital. So they're, they're going to have to do a lot more to court capital. And the more that they try to extort the holders of capital, the more the capital is going to flee and go somewhere else where it's treated better. And that's really what the price of gold is saying, uh, is that there, it portends a lot of political uh, unrest and disturbance and things like that. And, and just to follow up on that, I, I know maybe I'm getting a little... Uh, off the subject here, but it wouldn't, I mean, it sounds like that's going to be a good thing in the long run. I mean, there's always, I mean, after a crisis, there's always, I mean, good always tends to come, uh, come after that. I mean, unless, I mean, because I mean, today you look at, as you're saying, we're in the information age and it's much more difficult for governments to control their economies and a lot of these businesses, I mean, aren't, uh, I mean, you're talking about governments having to court capital. I mean, isn't that a good thing for everyone? Because then governments are going to have to basically compete against each other and have better policies. I mean, much lower taxes, lower barriers to entry, and you know, maybe they'll give some businesses subsidies. I mean, is it, I mean, in the very long run, is that going to be a good thing? Well, you know, it, it all comes from perspective. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a good thing for everyone. There, there are people like the banks who receive big bailouts. It's not going to be good for them. You know, how are they going to be able to socialize their losses? 
Uh, so, you know, different industries are going to be affected different ways. But for the most part, if you engage in good, honest business, if you're exchanging value for value with people, if you're actually providing value to the economy, uh, if you're not using violence against people, if you're not uh, engaging in unsavory practices, then yeah, uh, you're going to benefit tremendously from this because ultimately what's going to happen is the holders of capital and the generators of wealth are going to be able to keep the fruits of their labors. And the reason for that is because it's not going to be profitable to extort it from them. And so, yeah, I mean, if you, if you provide value, if you're uh, a real productive member of society, yeah, it's going to be really good. If you're a parasite, and remember, governments, they only extort. At best, they're only able to redistribute wealth. They can't create any on their own. If they could, they wouldn't have to rely on a gun to get their top line. Uh, so, you know, they, they don't actually provide any you could say, useful purpose to society in the sense, and that's what the gold price is saying, their common stocks are going down because the value that they add to society is not there anymore. And so uh, it's going to become increasingly difficult for people who are employed in those areas or who rely on special, uh, you know, treatment protections or government enforced monopolies or things of that nature, they're going to have a very difficult, if not impossible, time uh, maintaining their market share. Whereas the people that uh, engage in useful, valuable services and provide goods to the economy, you know, the generators of wealth, the creators of wealth, uh, they're going to get to keep the benefits of their labor. So it'll be good for them. It'll be bad for uh, the parasites and the other uh, you know, basically criminals, people who engage in violence for a living. Now, Trace, I'm wondering how the emerging markets fit into this credit contraction. I mean, what happens to China and other nations? Aren't they in the midst of a major credit expansion? Yeah, China is, boy, has China got themselves a problem because they've really tried to uh, centrally plan their economy and uh, it's led to a lot of misallocations of capital, kind of what we're saying. You know, they're not able to, government's not able to generate any wealth or create it themselves. They're only able to redistribute it. And what China, by and large, has done is they've redistributed it into uh, unproductive areas. So, you know, China has got a lot of problems, but, you know, some of the other emerging markets, I actually think they're going to have a, an easier or a better time transitioning into the information age. And the reason for that is because they don't have a lot of the, uh, the leftover excess uh, stuff that's just kind of sitting around, whether it's regulations or legislation or uh, different cultural um, ways of doing things that were good in the industrial age and led to the generation of wealth, but which won't be very efficient or useful in the information age. And in many cases will actually be very harmful for uh, being able to generate wealth and create it. And a prime example of this is uh, like pension funds, for example, you know, for government workers in the U.S. Uh, look at California. They're, if, they, if they really had to be honest about how much they owed in pension funds and stuff, it'd be something like a trillion dollars or a couple trillion dollars or something like that. I mean, uh, you'll look at Illinois. They're four and a half billion dollars uh, negative cash balance. Uh, their DMV just got evicted for not paying rent. Uh, so, you know, if you've got a lot of these... Uh, these types of, you know, legacy assets is what people like to call them. They're going to be very, th these legacy assets and these legacy cultural norms and ways of doing business and things like that, they're probably going to become like uh, anchors uh, and albatrosses, you know, lead millstones around the, the necks of, of the creators and the producers of wealth. And the emerging markets, they they are large, by and large they aren't encumbered with a lot of these uh, a lot of this dead weight so it's a lot easier to swim in those areas and make money yeah and i mean and, and we're really starting to see um you know some people talked about the decoupling and then they were kind of ridiculed a couple of years ago but i think this year we're really starting to see a decoupling if you look at how i mean i'm sure you have the stock markets in a lot of these places are basically performing fantastically, and you look at the U.S. and Europe are basically stuck in the mud and can't go anywhere. 
Yeah, and, you, and, you know, Brazil's a prime example. Uh, there's just a lot of wealth being generated down there. And, you know, a lot of this is because, you know, U.S. and Europe, they've got a lot of these legacy uh, encumbrances that are just, you know, they're, they're giant wealth destruction uh, machines. Uh, and they, they take so much of the wealth in the form of their taxation, whether it's Social Security or self-employment tax or uh, the income taxes or whatever it is. That they take so much of the production of the economy and they just throw it in the money hole and they light it on fire uh, and they just destroy the wealth. And, you know, in a lot of these emerging markets, you know, when they earn some money, I mean, they really had to work to do that. And so they, they value it a lot more. And that's where, you know, that's where a lot of the, the wealth and the healthy economies actually are. Uh, you know, Brazil and uh, some of these other places. Like I'm headed down to Argentina for uh, about the month of October. We're going to be looking at some business deals down there. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity outside of the legacy uh, the legacy governmental areas like the U.S. and Europe. But you want to be away from those that try to really centrally plan like China uh, and which are so dependent on the legacies because, uh, you know, China and America have a very entwined uh, relationship when it comes to how the money flows. And China is going to see some, they're, they're going to see some issues from that. Now, uh, before we close here, I just have one or two more questions. Let's talk about the other metals. I know you're bullish on platinum. Can, can you explain why platinum is attractive here? And do you feel it's more attractive than gold and silver presently? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm very bullish on platinum. I wrote an article on it in July of 2009, recommend people buying it. Uh, it was 1118 an ounce. Now it's 1650 an ounce. Uh, the reasons I was so bullish about it is first, uh, it has an R squared correlation coefficient with gold of about 0.95. So that means that 95% of platinum's price uh, can be predicted by whatever the gold price does. So whatever up or downside potential you have from gold will, for the most part, show up in the platinum price. Now, the other reason I like platinum is all of the reasons you'd want to own gold, it's... Uh, you know, it's indestructible. It's well, not indestructible. It it doesn't, you know, it doesn't uh, erode. It doesn't corrode. It can be used as money. It's an element. It's a tangible asset. All these reasons that you would use gold as money can also apply to platinum. Uh, where I really like platinum is when you start getting into the supply, both the supply side and the demand side for it. Supply side, there's about 77 million ounces of gold produced every year. Uh, there's about 7 million ounces of platinum produced every year. So there's 11 times as much gold mined and produced uh, but as, as platinum. So, wow, you know, shouldn't platinum be 11 times as expensive? Well, why is it not? Because you've got these huge above-ground stockpiles of gold. In other words, it's used as money, and platinum is consumed. So not only is it a lot more rare than gold, but we actually use it. And what do we use it for? Well, we use it for catalytic converters and the green economy, which will be another big bubble, uh, and government will go out and say, you got to buy platinum at whatever price to put in this solar panel or put in this windmill you know, ways to reallocate capital uh, into areas that aren't necessarily productive and they'll buy high and they'll sell, uh, they'll sell low and get a bad deal. And, you know, I'll, I'd like to be there to sell them the platinum that they're going to pay more than it's worth. And so, and they're going to have to get it and there's only 7 million ounces of it. Uh, so, you know, I think that we're going to see supply side, you just don't have as much production as gold. Demand side, we've got to use it to uh, catalytic converters, all of this green economy stuff. The governments are going to be moving in to go green, and they're going to have to get a ton of platinum in order to do that. And so, uh, and then you add to it, now there are some platinum and palladium ETFs. So, and I'm not a fan of ETFs, I think they're a bunch of crap, but what they do show is that there's investor money, investment money moving into platinum and palladium. People are beginning to use them as stores of value. They're beginning to use them for their monetary uh, reasons. And so all of those things kind of coming together just shows that, uh, you know, it shows, it paints a very bullish fundamental picture for platinum. Uh, 
and at the same time you get a lot of the correlation to the price of gold. Oh, and then one last point is, at least when I wrote the article, the platinum to gold ratio was about 1.3. So it took 1.3 ounces of gold to buy one ounce of platinum. Uh, that, was, that is extremely cheap because the historic ratio is about two ounces of gold to buy one ounce of platinum. So I was like, hey, if you buy platinum, you'll probably be able to increase your net worth when denominated in gold ounces. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, people who bought platinum, platinum went up faster in terms of dollars than gold did. So uh, people had an increase in their net worth in gold ounces. Uh, and then, of course, you know, if you want to normalize that for dollars, it was a huge return. So, like 45% in eight months or something like that, unleveraged. So, uh, I'm very bullish on platinum. I still am uh, because of the supply and the demand components of it and because I think people should own real tangible things, particularly rare commodities like this instead of the fiat currencies. And so, when you look at the total amount of uh, fiat currency out there, there's $13 trillion insured by FDIC or something obscene like that. Uh, and there's only, uh, at current market prices, there's, you know, those 7 million ounces of platinum, that's going to be close to $10 billion. So there's only $10 billion of new platinum uh, mined every year. And there's $13 trillion of, ins of FDIC <laughs> insured bank accounts or whatever it is. Uh, so just the sheer amount of paper out there, uh, as Alan Greenson says, there's nowhere to go but gold. And, you know, I would add, well, you got gold and silver and platinum and palladium. <laughs> but when you're talking about these uh, trillions and trillions of dollars and there's only $10 billion worth of platinum out there, uh, good luck, you know. There's just not enough real tangible things for all the paper out there. Now, how does silver compare to platinum because you said the R squared quotient between platinum and gold is 95%. Does that mean that platinum is actually more tied to gold's movements than silver? Uh, they're very close. Silver, silver is also, you know, very close to gold. What, what you, what you see with silver is, uh, it doesn't move very much, but when it does move, it moves a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, you get, like 90% of the price movement and 10% of the time. I mean, silver is a very restless metal. Uh, but it has all the same monetary attributes as gold or platinum does. And uh, But, you know, there's about 550 million ounces of silver produced every year. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, they consume a lot of silver, but there's also a lot of above-ground stockpiles. I mean, how many people have a bunch of silver coins or... Uh, other silver, physical silver investments, uh, you know, a lot more silver investments than there are people with platinum coins, for example. So uh, I think there's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit uh, easier on the supply side to produce silver than platinum or produce gold than platinum. Uh, and on the demand side, you know, we'd actually consume a lot of silver, so that's a, that, that would be the same as platinum. So if I were to rank them, I'd say Platinum is my favorite, silver is my next favorite, and then gold. Uh, but I think people should own some of all of it. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's, your rankings are very interesting. Now, what exactly is the end game? I mean, I know that you talked about a, a new currency system with these metals being money, and I completely agree with you. I mean, you just have to look at what's going on here, and, and you know, the system is just, I mean, as you said, it doesn't collapse, it evaporates, if I'm quoting you correctly. Right. So what exactly is the end game? I mean, because I think some people, they do believe in these metals that we're, we're going to have this, and obviously they're in a bull market, but they're going to soar and, and go vertical at some point. Um, I, I mean, do you think they're going to go down maybe a, after making a top, or they're going to go down and then maybe stay at a certain level, or are they going to have a permanently high plateau for you know, when we have this new system, like what are your thoughts exactly on this end game? Well, you know, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. <coughs> you know, why is gold produced? Because of the value it adds to society in performing mental calculations of value. You know, we, we use the term foot, you know, to perform mental calculations of length. And we use the term pound to perform mental calculations of weight. Uh, 
gold is what allows us to perform mental calculations of value. And this is what I, you know, I really talk about this a lot on Run to Gold. Uh, if you want to be able to build a solid financial castle, you have to be able to measure things in terms of gold. And part of that is, you know, beginning to use gold as a unit of account and beginning to use gold in your contracts and beginning to use gold as a currency. And I like gold money, for example. I mentioned them on my site. And what gold money does is they'll take LBMA bars, London Bullion Market Association bars, they'll stick them in a vault in Zurich or Hong Kong or London, and then they'll digitize uh, the, the ounces. And you can actually use those ounces kind of like PayPal and transfer them between other gold money accounts. So, for example, I could send you one gram of gold and you could give me uh, a pizza for example. And so we can begin to use gold and silver in ordinary daily transactions. And gold money has been around for like 10 years and they got a billion dollars of bullion in the vault, uh, you know, and they're registered by the Jersey Financial Services Commission. So your, your, your capital is relatively safe there. It's insured. It's titled in your own name. It's not lent out to anybody. And you're able to use it for currency. And that's kind of, that's the end game I see happening going from using fiat currency with fractional reserve banking to using commodity currency, whether it's gold, silver, or platinum, and you can use all three of them in gold money as currency, uh, using commodity currency with 100% reserves. Uh, and that's going to be a big change. And, you know, when we're talking about mental calculations of value, I like to buy low and sell high. And so... You know, in 1999, the Dow gold ratio was 44 to 1. So, you know, we need, in 1980, it was about 1 to 1. So, in 19, you know, in 1999, the Dow was expensive priced in gold. So, the signal was sell the Dow, buy gold. And the signal will be sell, go, sell gold and buy the Dow when the ratio is about one to one or maybe two to one. And just to show how going with these trends can play out, if you had enough capital to buy 100 ounces of gold in 1999, if instead you bought, let, let's say you had 500 GE shares, which was equal to 100 ounces of gold. If you sold your GE shares because the Dow was expensive and gold was cheap, sell the GE shares, buy the gold, those 100 ounces of gold today will buy 8,333 shares of GE. So that's what it's about. It's about being able to play uh, these general trends that are moving. And, you know, the, the stock market, it's going to go to about 1 to 1, the Dow to gold ratio, 1 to 1 or 2 to 1. And so for now, it's accumulate a lot of bullion. And then when the bullion gets expensive, sell it and buy the other assets, whether it's real estate or, or stocks. And so that's how I want to at least play this for profit. And you're using a type of analysis that I really like to employ on my own market and technical analysis, and that's intermarket analysis. Because when you have an unstable, evaporating monetary system, what something is worth, you can't just look at its price. You have to compare it to basically everything else in the capital markets. And so, and I, I guess you could probably use the same strategy when you're looking at uh, the monetary metals. I mean, for example, after silver, you know, we're seeing silver have a nice run here. Maybe that ends in a couple months, and then maybe you would say, hey, you know, I'm going to sell a little bit of my silver and put that in gold or platinum. Would you agree with me on that? Yeah, or you sell the silver and buy some stock. You know, maybe you have a stock you want to buy. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, on my on Run to Gold, I have a little tab at the top that says key ratios, and, and it updates constantly uh, these ratios between gold and the Dow and gold and oil and gold and uh, other assets. But yeah, it, the, the problem we've got is there's price and there's value. And when, unfortunately, with these fiat currencies and with the dollars, the world reserve currency, what's happened is we can't, like price and value are now completely separated from each other. There is no way to perform an accurate mental calculation of value using the Federal Reserve note dollar. And so that's what I like to do. I like to take, you know, the price in dollars of the of the Dow and the price of the of the of gold in dollars and I cancel the numerator and denominator uh with the dollar sign. So I just 
you know, I just completely removed the Federal Reserve note dollar from any calculation experiment. I just, you know, remove that variable from the equation <laughs> because we don't really need to use it, at least not for performing mental calculations of value. Who knows what they're going to do next? Right, and that's why, I mean, that's basically when you, yeah, I completely agree. It's about value, and, you know, you find value by comparing the monetary metals and basically comparing a certain market to another market you know, or, or comparing a market to all the other markets. I mean, that's how you find the, the real value and not just by looking at the price of it in dollar terms, as you're saying. Right. Now, uh, Trace, as we close here, can you tell our listeners how they can buy a copy, how they can buy a copy of your book and where they can find your work and get in touch with you if they'd like to get in touch with you? Oh, yeah. Um, my website is runtogold.com. <laughs> Pretty descriptive, huh? And uh, you can find the liquidity pyramid on there for free, or uh, there's a little banner, the Great Credit Contraction book, and people can go click on that, and uh, it'll take them to creditcontraction.com where they can purchase the book. Uh, but there's, you know, there's over there are a couple hundred articles on Run to Gold that explain monetary science and. Uh, economic law and apply it to current events and I have interviews with different people on there also kind of like uh, yourself here and so it, it becomes a very fun resource and so people can sign up to get free email updates uh, and get the latest articles and things like that so that, that's what I'd, you know, I'd recommend people do is uh, go over to rundogold.com and kind of sniff around and read some articles find some that have fun titles and uh, come and Come and see if they learn something new. <laughs> Link through your time today. We really appreciate it and all the great insight. This is Aaron Crown of MortgageImplode.com, and you're listening to Run to Gold.